That live report a moment ago by our reporters Karinda Jagmahan and Junia Kamalo about this sort of strange fight between the ANC Women's League and the ANC province of KwaZulu-Natal over who should have held the World Cup. Now, of course, all of this emanates from that incident over the weekend during the Springbok victory tour through Durban when the MC of the event very clearly, it seems to me, said that the Premier would hold up the trophy. Instead, Sibani Duma, the MEC for Economic Development and leader of the ANC in KwaZulu-Natal, held up the trophy with the Springbok player, Eben Etzebeth, while the Premier, Nusa Dube Nube, was left, well, standing on her own, applauding uh, the men holding the trophy. Professor Bekin Gumazulu is the director of the Nelson, uh, he's at Nelson Mandela University and director of the Centre for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy there. Professor, good afternoon to you. I mean, on one level, this is so strange. Here we are watching members, bodies of the ANC, arguing about holding a Rugby World Cup. It seems quite petty, but aren't there also big sort of undercurrents beneath all of this? Uh, good afternoon, Stephen, and good afternoon to your viewers. This is uh, concerning, and it was unnecessary, because normally what happens in terms of protocol, you discuss, you decide uh, beforehand as to what the, uh, I mean, what's going to happen, how the proceedings are going to unfold, and then when the event starts, you just activate the plan which was already put in place. On this one, if this was just one incident, maybe people would have overlooked it. But the concern is that uh, there have been a number of instances where the MEC, Esponis um, Duma, uh, is seen to have uh, undermined uh, the premier, that is, Nomsa uh, Tubengube. So this is a, a cause for concern, which is exactly the reason why we have a number of people complaining about this incident to the extent that even the national office uh, of the NC Women's League had to be brought in. Not to say the least, of course, that the opposition political parties also saw it necessary to comment about this issue. Unfortunately, this has been reduced to just uh, as Bonesso Duma undermining uh, Nomsa Tubengube on gender issues. But it goes beyond that because it, it tarnishes the image of the organization, given the fact that uh, they all belong to the same organization and they are both leaders of the ANC in Guazunatal. So this is something unwarranted and it should be attended to as a matter of agency. Are there other things going on here? I mean, it seems to me that the ANC Women's League, sure, they must speak for women and particularly women in the ANC and they've done that here. Do you think they would have done this if they didn't have the support of the rest of the ANC? Does this maybe tell us something about the relationship between the national ANC and the KwaZulu-Natal ANC? Maybe. Uh, although we wouldn't, uh, uh, in fact, uh, say that, but uh, of course uh, they say for everything that happens, we have to look beyond what you see at face value and then try to understand the underlying factors and, of course, any hidden messages uh, that might not be open to the public. The reality of the matter is that uh, KwaZulu Natal is a very interesting province for a number of reasons. One, it is the biggest uh, province of the ANC. And then, of course, the fact that these things normally happen either uh, in Eteguini or in Peter Marisbeck, uh, which is the provincial, uh, um, I mean, center of, uh, I mean, the provincial head office, or uh, as I would say, uh, of the of the province in Guazul Natal, and then Eteguini being the economic hub. Anything that happens between the two will definitely generate interest across the party divide. So the reason why this is becoming a big issue uh, is because of that reason in part. But then secondly, you would also recall that all other political parties have a general interest in what happens in Guazul Natal, given the numbers that are there, and then of course the economic significance of the province. On this one, the national office of the ANC is particularly concerned because if things go wrong in Guazul Natal, that is going to affect the plans of the ANC at a national level, more especially now that the party is preparing for uh, the 2024 general election. So that is why then we have the ANC Women's League being vocal on the matter, and they didn't hide the fact that they've been watching uh, the actions of uh, uh, MSC Sponiso Duma with a keen interest. Only now, when they thought that this had reached a saturation point, they felt it was necessary for them uh, to then make their feelings known, while in the past they've kept it I mean, a secret, hoping that the situation was going to correct itself. That was never to be, and now they are commenting about the issue. There's so many elements to this. So, yes, we now have, I don't think we've ever seen this before, really, a, a, a league, a women's league in this case. Maybe the ANC Youth League has been involved in fights like this, but the ANC Women's League against the province. 
Uh, we also have the province's response, the KwaZulu-Natal ANC being very personal in its response to Dina Pule, who's the Deputy Secretary-General of the ANC Women's League, who issued this statement. And, Professor, I'm sure you remember probably better than I what happened around her, the findings against her by that parliamentary process uh, that she was guilty of giving government contracts to a man described at the time as her partner. I mean... <laughs> You suddenly have almost the worst parts of, well, you have sort of bits of the ANC's dirty laundry being aired again in public. I mean, this is bad for the whole party, and the national ANC seems to be quiet. There is political negligence. We, I mean, we can talk about this thing from sunrise to sunset, but the bottom line is that this is political negligence. And in fact, um, uh, people don't tend to see the bigger picture. This might appear to be a squabble between Dinapole and the leadership in the province, but the reality is that uh, this uh, reflects negatively on the organization as a whole. And uh, I would be surprised if the leadership of the ANC does not attend to this matter uh, uh, instantly. Because uh, if you see these kinds of things happening, then of course it means that there is ill discipline within the organization. That is the impression created out there. And then, of course, secondly, it means that people, the will be supporters of the party, will now have to think twice just because of this minor issue which should have been avoided. So I think that uh, the onus is on the leadership of the ANC to deal with this matter properly. And uh, the best way to do it will be to do it behind the closed doors. In other words, deal with the matter clandestinely as opposed to doing it in public. Because the moment you do it in public, chances are the one on the other side will have to defend himself or herself, and then the situation will get out of hand. But if they call them in closed doors and then discuss this issue and then cite specific guidelines of the organization, and then, of course, cite from specific sections of the constitution of the party, then they can contain the situation. If they leave it like this, then it means they'll be opening a can of worms and it will be too late for them to contain the situation. They better act now rather than later. Professor Gomez Zulu, I mean, it seems to me uh, it's quite a strange series of events. So last weekend, 10 days ago now, Saturday night, we win the Rugby World Cup. Monday evening, President Cyril Ramaphosa decides that he needs to give an address to the nation. And he really just focused, frankly, I think I can say this journalistically, on what he sees as the achievements of his government. And it looked, I think, to many people like an opportunity to electioneer. It was a campaigning speech at the end. We got a public holiday. Um, then we had Julius Malema, the leader of the EFF, in the hours after the Springbok victory, uh, congratulating the national rugby team. Didn't refer to the Springboks necessarily. This last weekend, he gives a speech at the Standard Bank Arena. I think he was speaking to the EFF ground forces in uh, Gauteng, in which he said that they shouldn't be called the Springboks. He uh, said essentially that he had had sort of failure of, uh, I'm not quoting directly now, of revolutionary consciousness. Uh, almost doing a sort of an about turn. Now we have, I mean, on of all things, uh, a victory tour. We have this huge fight in the ANC around this. Is there something here about, I mean, all of our politicians, that something as simple as winning a sporting event turns into these political sideshows? <laughs> you know what, Stephen? Uh, our politicians, sometimes they become a joke. But if you <laughs> tell them they're a joke, they're going to fight you. The reality here uh, is that uh, the Springboks have done a sterling job. I mean, winning the Webb Ellis Cup four times is not a child's play. And, and in fact, they have made history by doing that. So instead of us celebrating this issue and then, of course, rallying behind the Springboks and then giving them all the support they need, we are then doing the direct opposite, dividing the nation, dividing even one political party in this matter. Uh, it's not something that we are supposed to be doing. So there are a lot of things that people are going to be doing with the victory of Amapopo. And coincidentally, uh, the center where, where, which I'm currently heading at the Nelson Mandela University is organizing an event on the 23rd uh, of uh, this month where we'll be looking at uh, the meaning of uh, the victory of the uh, Springboks and then, of course, linking it to the racial issues, uh, reflecting on history as to what happened in 1995, uh, 2007, and 2019, when the Springboks won, the nation seemed to be united. But immediately thereafter, we had, the, we had issues like the penny sparrow matter. We had people, uh, uh, some white guys, uh, putting a black guy uh, in Pumalang in a coffin, threatening to bury him alive. So there have been a number of these racial elements, which then negate all the good things that the Springboks have done. Whether we use the name Springboks or not, is neither here nor there. The reality is 
the Springboks have won and they've made history. We should be celebrating as a nation and not as one racial group and not as one political party and not as one faction within a political party. Because if you do that, then it would mean that we are not seeing the bigger picture and we are not appreciative of the work that has been done by the Springboks under very trying conditions. If you remember that they won 29-28, uh, they won 16-15, they won 12-11, it wasn't an easy victory, but they won nonetheless, and we should be applauding that instead of doing the kinds of things that we are doing and being childish in the process, to say the least. I mean, there's so much to it. I mean, Professor, I'm going to get uh, philosophical for a moment, and I realize rugby, politics, and philosophy don't always go together. But it seems to me, um, and Professor Andre Duvenach once made this point from the University of the Northwest, that some of our politicians maybe don't know in which direction they are going. And the result of that is that people are looking frantically for direction. To put it another way, what we're seeing now would have been unthinkable when the ANC was led by uh, Thabo Mbeki, for example. Uh, people knew what direction they were going in then, even during the Zuma era for a large part, I would argue. And is that part of it? Our politicians don't actually know where they're going. And it's hard to know. A country like South Africa is difficult to govern. I have some sympathy with that. But is that one of the consequences? Is this what we're seeing now, a symptom of that sort of lack of direction in some way? Uh, you have said it all, Stephen. You see, the moment you don't respect the constitution of the party, then that is a recipe for disaster. The moment you have factional politics, of course, that doesn't occur well for the growth of the party. And then the moment you don't see the bigger picture and everything that happens, it means that you have no direction. And if you don't have a direction, you just move with the wind. If the wind blows south, you move with it. It blows northwards, you move with it, because we have no sense of direction. What is needed here, it should start from the, crowd, um, the, the, the grassroots level, where you have political education. Some of our politicians, of course, people hate me for this, but it's true. Some of our politicians became politicians by chance. You happen to be at the right place at the right time, and then we're elected into a position, and then you found yourself being a leader when you don't have what it takes to be a leader. If you are a leader, we will only see your leadership prowess during times like this, when you have to stand out and then stand for the truth, regardless of whether you're getting favors or not. But then if you are doing something because you just want to get fame and it ends there, then it means we are no longer, I mean, we are, we are not a leader yet. We still need to be groomed appropriately. The point we are making about, um, and the point my colleague from Northwest made was the correct one, that if you don't have something to uh, bring people together, and then, of course, uh, to channel people towards a particular direction, they will be all over the show. And then if there is an incident like the one we are talking about right now, I will grab the opportunity because I want to shine as myself or as yourself without necessarily thinking about the consequences. That is where the problem lies. If you don't see the bigger picture, you think about the here and now and you don't care about what happens next. This notion that will cross the bridge when you get there is only reserved for, for a very few people who are lazy to think. Ordinarily, you know there is a bridge 100 meters away or a kilometer away. Start planning for it now. Not to say we'll cross the bridge when we get there. What if you get there and you die? What is going to happen? So that is the nature of our, of our politics at the moment. Our politicians are not trained from the beginning when they start at a grassroots level. We cannot then expect miracles once they occupy senior positions in, in government or anywhere in the leadership structures, even in the leadership of the party at a provincial level or at a, a regional level. If they are not well grounded in politics, you are going to see that through what they do and what they say. Professor Beckham Gomezulu, thank you very much indeed. From Nelson Mandela University, Director at the Centre for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy. Well,